The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. I will use international language. <laughs> 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 Es das Kroatische, die haben gelernt, ist der Islander. La Islander, kein La Feroa, ist das in der Gruppe der Insul Norda Lingol. La Feroa haben die Quaro Mil Parolando, so La Feroa im Mem, ist das Gruppe der Insul in der Norwegio, kein Islando. Die ist das autonome Parto der Danio. Eble. 60.000 dinascolo existas, and Yavo Dumil Elunicis, and Septic Lipoi in the Ili Sestic Set Kadukoi El Fremda Lingoi. Unu Lipo O Ritzen Dudek Windo Janko. So is the record. The Mil Vincent Fidek Ock, ne plu existas scribita lingvo, cia ciu est scribita en la dana. Sed la peruanoi conservis sia lingvon danzante, con scen danzo, e ogni prenu la parto, la mano de la lia, Kai Thomas Grand am Zirkel, Kai Oli Danzas, Pajante, Pajon Maldextren, Kai Du Pajon Dextren. So, und Stil Oli Konservis, Pli Ol Quartek Mil Versoi, Kai Oli Rekonstruis, La Tuta Lingon in La Degnauer Jacento de Kiu Versoi. In La Du deka jacento, oni recibis autonomion post la tua mont milito, kai oni komencis por fede la danan. Oni lernas nun, un nur la peruan kai la danan, nur de la tria klaso, set gis preskau de nascuda nivelo, almeno skribite, por la eblezo studi en Kopenhago o en la... Alia en Danio. Do, mi pensas que estas inda lerni di un lingua, xa estas interessa in historio, kai oni havas multan da libroi, kai da musico, rekonata estas la grupo tir, kio paras rock musicon, metal rock musicon, en la peroa, en la dana, kai en la angla, kai anko en la germana. Kaj la prefama danco kaj balado estas Omru Langi, kjo estas la longa serpento. Danko. Danko. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How many people in here speak uh, three languages or fewer? 
Fewer. That's not fewer, true. Fewer, fewer. <laughs> three or less. One, two, or three. One, two, or three, or zero. <laughs> okay. Can you put your hands up again? Because I want you to see each other. Okay, very good. Now, how many people in the room are happy right now with the level you're at in your languages? If you wrote them here, you're happy with where you are. Now look. Hmm. Oh, happy? Good for you guys. That's awesome. So uh, what I, I just said probably, I probably doesn't apply happy. to you, actually. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have a very short time. So what I want to say is, it's very easy for us, and I'll speak for myself, for me, to think that I'm not as good as someone because I feel the same way as everyone else. Say it again. It's easy for me to think that I'm not as good as someone else because I feel the same way as everyone else. Does that make any sense to you? No. Yes. No. Yeah, 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 because you, you're saying you don't feel particularly remarkable. Is that really that hard? No, it's not harsh at all. Time, time, time. Time, sorry. What I'm trying to say is that it's easy for us to look at people that we perceive as above us, especially with our hobby. Like, wow, I wish I could be like so and so, and you probably already thought of someone. Like, wow, I wish I could have a level in that language like that guy, or I wish I could talk to that person, but I can't, and that guy can. You can walk up on a conversation in a language you don't know, or you think you should know, because it's on here, and you, <laughs> and you can't do it. But everybody here, with the exception of these two exemplary gentlemen, are pretty much unhappy with where they are. They want to continue to go upward from where they are. If you ask the people that are your heroes that I consider titans of language learning, they're like the best of the best. They're also trying to improve. They don't think that they've got it. They probably don't have the idea about themselves that you have about them. So my message for you is that your languages, or your skill in languages, or how many you think are good, or how many you have, or whether or not you can even write anything except for the one you grew up with, is not who you are. Your languages are not who you are. So you should never feel anything about yourself because of anything to do with your languages. Even if you were the kind of person, who I want to talk to afterwards, by the way, that has moved to another country, and then you lost like some of your mother language, or all of it. Just because you've lost your language doesn't mean you've lost yourself because they're not the same thing. And everybody around you in this hobby is a community together. We're doing this together. You're not alone. And if you think that you're alone, come and talk to somebody, particularly someone that you respect or you think has something admirable, and ask them how they feel about what they're doing. Ask them what their progress is. We have a unique chance here to be in community with someone who normally we just see videos of. We can see them in their triumph. We can see them be victorious, see them do incredible things on the internet. And then we can come here and do something like this and ask them a question and say, hey, have you ever felt like you didn't do well? Have you ever felt like you totally failed something? Or where are you unhappy with where you are? How can we humanize the contact? That's why I like these so much. The community part makes, it a makes you able to actually like have a conversation with these people that normally you just have to admire from afar and only see their best selves. So we get a chance to share our struggles together about something, the main message is, your language is not who you are. That's what I wanted to say. Go. Nope. <laughs> I have a theory. How many of you here are left-handed? Okay, for all the other guys here. Have you ever wished that you could write with your left hand? Have you ever tried? <laughs> Why it's so hard? Why it's so hard? Practice. Practice. Lack of no. practice. So imagine now we build a business out of writing with the left hand. So the native here, who is the left handed? Like the natives, they will teach us the workshops and there's going to be app, and you pay and you practice. And still, three years from now, you will still do the exercise and you're still like very, like, really cracked at that. So, What's the real problem? I think the real problem is that every time we, we try to write with the left hand, we have the right hand right here. So the pen just magically switch here. It's like, fuck it, you know. It's a little easier to write with the right hand. So because when people break their right hand, actually, they can learn in two weeks. It takes two weeks. So my example here is that if I want to learn Finnish, this is my left hand. I'm trying to learn Finnish and speak Finnish, but woo, English is right here. <laughs> and it's so easy. So I think in language learning, this applies pretty well, because if you go to Italy, 
Well, you cannot use your right hand because we don't really understand right hand in English. So you can try as much as you want, but we only understand when you try with your crappy left hand and you will have to get used to this. So how do we recreate the same? This is more like I don't have an answer for this yet, or maybe I have. Maybe I have. But <laughs> how do we recreate the same condition without break? I don't want to break my right hand, but how do I make sure that I can learn to write with my left hand without breaking my right hand? Because once this is broken, it's so easy to learn. And when it's not, it's really impossible because it's painful and oh, right hand is here. So the question is for you. The question is for you. Uh -huh. I cannot pronounce the question, guys, so I'm really challenged with that. So, how can we do this? That's just, uh, do you have an answer? Yeah, um, we can't just break our left hand just because, uh, our right hand just because we want to try this and learn. That would be, we could, but that would be stupid. So, what I, so just tie your right hand behind your back for the whole day. But let's In, apply this to English and languages. Uh, yeah, yeah, th I'm coming to that. <laughs> that, that, that means taking a vacation to Italy, where people don't speak English. But if you don't learn uh, German or French. Yeah, then you take a, a vacation <laughs> to Germany or for, to France. <laughs> but then you have the Alex problem, that you go to the nation and you <laughs> learn less. So this is, I'm in Lithuania or Finland, they will talk to me in English. So they understand the right hand. What I, always do, what, I, what I always do when I'm in Italy is that I pretend I don't know one word of English. Well. You don't have to because they don't understand. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> Italy, unfortunately, doesn't apply. I mean, this is more for if you go to Babylon. I, I, I went to places in Italy where they do speak English. So when I start speaking Italian to them, they reply me in English. You met my ex-girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Um, and then, then I just say, say in Italian, I don't understand what you're saying. And then they start talking Italian to me. So just pretend you don't speak English. Works everywhere in the world. <laughs> it's true. You know, well, it doesn't always work, but it's a very, it's the best technique that I know. So, yeah, I'm a native English. Work in the, work in Mexico. Yeah, it works, uh, it works in uh, a lot of them. I have to say, I don't speak English in some other language. <laughs> at least, at least. <laughs> Isn't this about your own arm? <laughs> no, no, we're, no, we're talking yeah. about like preventing others from speaking English to you, but this is about your own arm. So yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't use your right arm ever. But it's <laughs> easier to tie ever. someone else's arm than your own. Right? Is it? Because that's what she's proposing, basically. You you force other people to speak. Hand. Yeah. Not let you. Yeah. Oh, make them tie it for you. Exactly. Well, you make them. You make them give you their left hand, so you can't. If you if you would take it with your right hand, it would be completely awkward. Uh, mm. Because the, the problem is that we, we jump to English with them, so we shouldn't have to have this option anymore, right? Yeah, yeah I go and shape with my hand, and then instead I should do my left. Bingo. Uh, then awkward, they can't be so. comfortable, so either they give up on you, or you only shake hands with people that are willing to use your left until you're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what, that's what she meant. <laughs> it depends on uh, some cultures, though, because that could mean you're using that hand like oh. on the toilet. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's why we don't write it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Three seconds? Huh? Okay. Um, okay. So. I thought first I would uh, speak about the Turkish language, but I'm not going to because uh, Turkish language is widely known, at least in Germany. So, how much do you guys know about the multi language? Who here has heard of it or, or speaks it? No. Okay, so, heard of it. okay, who speaks it? Multi Yeah, we're about that. Okay, so. Um, the multi language is actually very interesting because it's kind of a mix of, of um, Roman languages and Arabic. Uh, especially, um, I'm looking for, uh, for a sentence now where I can demonstrate what Maltese actually does, which is very interesting. If, if my cell phone will work, um, who here speaks Arabic? <coughs> you speak Arabic. Just one person? A little. Come on. A little. Okay. Three, or, well, that's quite meager, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to live with that. Okay, so, um, so in Arabic, uh, we have the word 
Luga, mm -hmm. which yeah. means language. In Maltese, um, we have. Um, Il Sin, but that's from the sun. Il Sin. Come again, what's the word? Il Sin, but that's from the sun. Yes, Il Sin also. But yes, true. We have Lisan in Arabic too. In Maltese, we have Lingua. And then we would say, uh, in Maltese, they would say lingua maltia, which is like the ending, the Arabic ending. Malti means Maltese, and then the ya is the feminine ending. So Maltese takes um, European words uh, and just changes them. Oh, look, my telephone works again. <laughs> um, so here, this is the first sentence in, on Wikipedia about the Maltese language, which goes, uh, this is again, goes to Ilse, Lesan in Arabic, so they have lingua and insane, both words. Is the here from he is the symbol here? Yes. She. she. Because in lingua here. Not national. No, I think it's yes, it's two B's. Okay. <laughs> so um in this sentence, you would have to know both Italian and Arabic to understand it. It says, Lingua Maltia, Ia del Si Nazionalita Repubblica Maltia. And then you have, you have words like, um, uh, let's see, um, Walad, which is like a son or boy. But then you have, and nobody would understand that, so simple sentences are, are not understand intelligible to Italian speakers, but things about technical uh, technical terms or, or, or sciences are not intelligible to Arabic speakers. So if you speak Italian or uh, French or Spanish or any Roman language and have some knowledge about Arabic, you should learn Maltese because it does <laughs> both. And it is so much fun to understand what goes on in the Arab world. Uh, and what, how it mixes with the, with the Christian world, and, and it, it, it's so much fun. So maybe try to pronounce it, everybody, really, really easy. Lingua, Lingua, Maltia, Maltia, Ia, Ia, Lilsi Nazionali, Lilsi Nazionali, Per Repubblica, Per Repubblica, Maltia, Maltia. Very good. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So essentially, is that really, is that kind of um, like where you have two words to refer to one's concept, kind of like in Spanish words, idioma and lingua, is that really common? Where there's like one word that comes from a Latin language and one word that comes from Arabic or one that comes it's from English? It's very common. You can use lingua and insane uh, interchangeably. Does not, like, lingua and insane mean the same thing. Lingua is feminine, insane is masculine. And there's no uh, difference of register or anything like that? Nothing. Really? Wow. No difference. Like. Um, they will. They will all also sometimes uh, be English words, especially. Right. I, I thought by, like twenty percent of the, the, the lexicon yes. was now English. Right? Shite. Anyway. <laughs> 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 they don't understand any English. That's horrible. That's good to learn. Is it? Is it? Is it language learning is? paradise. I don't okay. think so. Um. But. Entonces todo el mundo sabe vivir. Algo de español o mejor hablar inglés. Español también. Básicamente en un principio no tenía pensado hacer una presentación, pero bueno, la verdad es que me gustaría hablar por solo un minuto algo así, sobre un tema que digamos que para mí es esencial. Uh, yo seguro que la mayoría de, de ustedes no me conoce, pero tengo un canal en YouTube donde la mayoría de mis vídeos son simplemente canciones, son versiones de canciones, en general son tratadas canciones americanas traducidas en español o en otros idiomas. Y estoy hablando de eso no solamente para, digamos, uh, promocionar mi propio canal, sino también porque para mí eso de no solamente de hacer de tocar música, 
tiempo de escribir poesía o leer poesía en lenguas extranjeras, uh, para mí es esencial en el sentido de que te permite formar un lazo ilógico con el idioma. Y para mí eso, cuando hago eso, cuando, digamos, llego a ese punto en mi aprendizaje de un idioma, se me hace infinitamente más fácil ser una persona completa en ese idioma y hablar con, no solamente con fluidez, sino también con una especie de voz personal. Entonces, para quien, no, obviamente eso de tocar música, leer poesía, etc., en, en idiomas extranjeros es difícil, pero obviamente no es para todo el mundo. Pero, en mi opinión, es aconsejable en el sentido de que te permite, digamos, convertir tu aprendizaje de ese idioma en más que un simple pasatiempo y en una actividad que, no sé, una actividad más profunda y más compleja y más, para mí, más, mucho más in, in, enriquecedora también. Entonces, hay que leer, en mi opinión, hay que, oh, es mejor no solamente a conversar con personas, eh, aprender, ir a, acumulando vocabulario, sino también leer poesía, escribir. Yo, por ejemplo, me encanta escribir en lenguas extranjeras. Sé que es difícil y er, digamos que no siempre queda bien, pero igual, para mí es muy divertido y tocar música, cantar, cosas así.
That's a good point. I use it a lot. But I, I read an article, um, and the founder of Netflix, he said he wants to change that and make all the movies available everywhere in the world. Be yeah, because well, Netflix doesn't. They don't. They're not particularly uh, interested in region defining all of these yeah. films. They they want them to be available to everyone everywhere. So the fact that you can do this, Netflix is like, not well, yeah. Does it work? Uh, if, it, if it's in browsers, that means it works also for YouTube. Yep. Yeah. Because as you know, Germany is probably after North Korea yeah. the most <laughs> <laughs> Totally. You see, you're like, oh, this video's not available, this game out. This yeah. 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 So they were, they were, it's, it's the most popular video in Germany. This kann leider nicht gezeigt werden. The video in fact in Germany oh, this means, this means that you couldn't uh, watch it because the people which, with their dishcans, uh, they had some uh, crappy radio station, Russian radio station on, so you couldn't watch the video of the of the dashcam with the Chalibin's meter because, because you could song. listen a little bit of Russian radio. All the better internet is your friend, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many languages are there? I mean, I haven't checked them all. Um, I don't think they have more keys. They might. But it's a lot. It's quite a few. Like, if you go to the Brazilian one, for example, they even have multiple languages on that. You go to the dubbing at the bottom of the thing, and it goes like, you want to watch it in Spanish, or in Brazilian Portuguese, or in uh, Portuguese Portuguese, or in like, they have a bunch of different ones. I meant all of them. Oh, all of them. Oh, that one has every country. Okay. Every country. They just had a different IP. Hour. The tail's there. No problem, we put our name and password, but won't they block us? No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this, this makes it so that the German servers don't know that you're in Germany. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was asking about Germany, but um, how it is in China? It worked. Yeah. Same, same. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so what I was just wanted to bring up was that I'm Ooh. actually somewhat skeptical of the 100% legal thing. It's probably going to vary by country. Uh -huh. I don't want to make anyone paranoid, and I am not a lawyer, but at the same time, <laughs> don't assume that just because it's legal in Germany or the US. Okay, you can um, blame me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about blame, I just think I think, I think it, if you are concerned about that, it's worth verifying. The other side of things, it's probably perfectly safe because no one's gonna know because the surveillance doesn't actually work. But, yeah. Good point. To crack a VPN, you have to really want to go after you. I mean, unless yeah. you're a suspect for ISIS or child porn or something like that. But <laughs> <laughs> next year we won't see somebody, now we know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. You want to? Can I go? Yeah. Am I allowed to? Huh? Yes. Yeah. No. No. From which country are you going to pick us from? We can choose it. I should give this in English because I may end up using jargon that I don't know in other languages. Um, I'm going to talk about, so go ahead. All right, I'm going to talk about conlanging. I con, so conlang is a term that it's got derived from constructed language. This is a hobby I've had for a long time and arguably is what got me into wanting to learn human languages. <laughs> so we've got both at around the same time. Um, at any rate, the nutshell version of what it is is literally what it sounds like, yeah, sitting down and creating a language. Um, if you know your way, most people here probably know their way around how different uh, at least a number of different languages work. So you can sort of imagine what it would be like to say, what if what if a language were sort of like English but had a case system like Latin or had put the verb put the main verb at the end of the sentence like in German. Um, that's one major thing that conlangers end up doing. But it can also be sort of like a, a way of experimenting with grammar or sounds that you might be interested in. You might say Say you recently started taking Arabic, and you realized, hey, there are, there are sounds further back than velars. There's p, but there's also p. Um, how about I build a, build a different language that has p in it, but maybe doesn't have something else in it that I don't like so much about Arabic? Um, I don't. I, I like Arabic, so nothing against that. And, um, another, on the other, and the other hand. 
It can also be a way to express, help conceptualize concepts that one might not be, might have a word for in, their, in one's native language or in, an, in any current language. I, for instance, because I needed to say this for, at least for my own notes and stuff, I came up with the word, that, the word kaidalu, which I defined as referring to a particular ethical concept, a concept of a system of ethics under which basically you have your own system and everyone else has their own system and everyone is okay with what everybody else has. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what context I wanted to say that in, but I, it was, it, I wanted a specific word for this, for something that I had originally needed a paragraph for, so I just up and created one. Um, something you all, I think you all see a lot of our um, constructed languages in movies and novels. I don't know how popular Game of Thrones is outside of the US. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. It's pretty international now. You know yeah. nothing, Jeff. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not that, but Star Trek, um, Dothraki, Klingon, um, Klingon called the Jack. Um, <coughs> a little bit, at least. It, can, it helps, having an actual language helps to add realism to a story. So it's becoming a thing to hire a conliner for your for your book or movie. Usually, it's the large film studios that have the money for it. Um, also, another thing that another thing people do is sometimes they'll they'll be a natural language that they see and they think it's a really cool language, but they <coughs> sort of want to regularize one of the features. Um, suppose, suppose one, suppose one were studying Arabic, and at first Arabic uses Arabic words are formed from three-letter roots. Um, if anyone, if anyone is not familiar with it, suppose one wanted to to create a language under which that system were much more regular than it is in Arabic. In Arabic, the the patterns, the vowels that you insert between the consonants have some, some sort of historical meaning associated with them, but by and large, you just have to memorize words like in any other language. Um, but you might want to create a conline under which um, that system were more regular and say your, your one three-letter three root um, plus pattern, you could, you could predict exactly what it would mean if you knew the pattern. Um, Alternate histories are also a thing. Um, there's a conlang Benedict, I think it is. Um, I believe this was this under this language. The assumption was that. Oh. All right. Well. <laughs> Ja, das ist jetzt eine spontane, ein spontaner Beitrag. Und ich dachte mir, da ist es okay. Ja. Ja, Aber jetzt noch die Frage, möchtet ihr Standarddeutsch, so wie ich jetzt spreche? Ja, 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 ja. Gute Antwort. Ja. Und zwar, ich habe mir jetzt spontan Thema entschieden, das eigentlich nicht so viel mit Sprache zu tun hat. Aber ich habe gedacht, es hat was mit Kultur zu tun und auch mal mit einem anderen Aspekt. Und vielleicht ist ja für den einen oder anderen was dabei. Also, äh, ich lese privat wahnsinnig gern, aber ich lese ganz wenig Romane oder so, sondern ich lese eigentlich nur Krimis. Ich bin total die Krimi-Leserin und die ersten lachen schon, das hat immer so Krimis, ja, ja, so seitliche Literatur. Aber ich habe mich in meinem Studium äh, einmal damit beschäftigt, mit Krimis äh, und ein bisschen recherchiert. Und äh, Krimis sind eigentlich von der soziologischen Sicht her ganz eine interessante Genre der Literatur. Allein wie die ganzen Figuren an sich äh, besetzt sein, druckt irrsinnig viel äh, darüber aus, wie eine Kultur, äh, zum Beispiel gegenüber der Polizei oder gegenüber einem Verbrecher, äh, was sie dafür Einstellung haben. In meiner äh, Arbeit habe ich äh, einen speziellen Vergleich gemacht, äh, 
im, Krimis im deutschsprachigen deutschsprachigen Raum, also Deutschland, Österreich und die Schweiz. Und im lateinamerikanischen äh, Raum, das, also ich habe Spanisch studiert, deswegen ist das so zustande gekommen. Und das war wahnsinnig interessant, weil zum Beispiel in deutschsprachigen Krimis, also die Original aus dem deutschsprachigen Raum sein, äh, ist der Held eigentlich allem die Polizei äh, und, und man... Äh, in, in die Bücher kommt aus, ja, die Polizei, die sucht den Mörder und das wird dann passen und am Ende verhaftet die Polizei den Mörder und alles gut, der Mörder ist im Gefängnis und je, yeah, Gerechtigkeit. <lacht> in lateinamerikanische Krimis aber ist das oft ganz anders, weil einfach der Gesellschaft, die Gesellschaft der Polizei oder dem Staatsapparat gegenüber ganz eine andere Einstellung entgegenbringt. Und sagt, ja, okay, die Polizei kann ihn jetzt verhaften, aber ist wirklich der Richtige verhaftet worden? Ist jetzt wirklich Gerechtigkeit entstanden? Oder war es aber die Polizei oder der Staatsapparat eigentlich der Böse? Also in die Krimis kommt auch ganz eine spezielle ähm, soziologische Überlegung mit dazu. Und auch über die Geschichte hat sich das verteilt. Also es kennt sicher ähm, die ganz die alten Krimis, ähm, Sherlock Holmes, ähm, Agatha Christie ist auch total alt. Und, äh, <lacht> <lacht> und äh, wer ist da eigentlich der Detektiv? Es ist nie die Polizei. Es ist die Miss Marple, die, die alte Schachtel <lacht> von nebenan oder Herr Piporo oder der belgische Privatdetektiv oder Sherlock Holmes, der, der kiffen da irgendwas. <lacht> ja, aber es ist nie die Polizei. Warum? Weil um diese Zeit, auch um, um die Wende äh, ins 20. Jahrhundert, hat man auch der Polizei noch nicht diesen, äh, das, das zugetraut, dass sie äh, solche Mordfälle lösen können und dass sie auch Gerechtigkeit ähm, wiederherstellen können. Also es ist einfach ganz interessant, was in Krimis transportiert wird und äh, ganz interessant, was die Figuren die in einem Krimi vorkommen, äh, widerspiegeln. Auch zum Beispiel, Sherlock Holmes hat einen Dr. Watson, Miss Marvel hat den Mr. Stringer, also so den Helfer, eigentlich den dummen Helfer, der Helfer ist immer der Dumme. Aber warum? Es braucht immer einen Dummen, damit der andere gut ausschaut. Also es ist total, ähm, also falls ihr mal in nächster Zeit einen Krimi lest, es gibt auch ganz viele un, wie soll man sagen, unblutige Krimis. Es muss ja nicht immer gleich Thriller und Psychopath oder so sein. Äh, aber schaut mal und versucht mal so ein bisschen zu hinterfragen, warum ist die Person jetzt als Detektiv ausgebildet und warum ist die Person als Opfer und wer, wer fließt eigentlich noch mit einem? Meistens, wenn es ein guter Krimi ist, dann sind die Personen nicht irgendwie zufällig gewählt. Und äh, vielleicht habt ihr auch mal Interesse daran zu schauen, wie ich das in meiner eigenen äh, Kultur und wie ist das in der literarischen Kultur meiner Zielsprache? Also ich finde das ganz äh, interessant und vielleicht will er auch mal oder andere was probieren. Und wer gerne drin ist, ist, kann gerne nach mit mir diskutieren. Ja? Ah. <lacht> und ich hoffe, es habe ich auch verstanden. <lacht>
and you know the literate people they also speak Cantonese somehow. So clearly, Chinese character is also not fundamental to the language. And talking about the uh, the the script itself, the characters, and most people believe that um, well, it's not most people, but it's commonly known as ideogram. It's, people believe it's uh, ideographic. It's every every character is supposedly come from some uh, some picture or something. This is also not true because most, the great majority of Chinese words have a radical, uh, well, have multiple radicals, but they tend to have uh, one radical that gives like a very vague sense of meaning. Or this is something related to do water, or maybe something that was passing a room in a water ten years ago, something like that. But you know, it gives a very vague sense of um, vague indication of, of what the word means, and the rest of the words, uh, the, the rest of the character often actually gives a pronunciation, so it's half phonetic very often. And uh, another common misconception is that uh, every character has one pronunciation and every character has at least one meaning. Uh, this is also not true because many characters have multiple, multiple pronunciation and many characters also have no meaning. Uh, and there are many characters that have to be uh, used in com combination with other characters for it to carry any meaning. And uh, what else? I have one more. Oh. You have two more. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Chinese, what is this language? I think most people here as polyglots, we, we all know that Chinese is not a single language. There, I don't know what the official count is these days of how many languages there are, but the one, one very fairly major common misconception is that Cantonese is somehow like a very important language within the Chinese family. I mean, it's important in the sense that there, uh, it's, it's one of the major immigrant uh, languages that's that's spread around the world. But it's actually, uh, within China, it's, it's not even uh, a dialect with the most speakers. The, the biggest language family outside of Mandarin in China is called the Wu dialect. It comes from the region around Shanghai. And um, uh, the, the, the one characteristic of this uh, family is that, as a family, they have very, very low mutual intelligibility within this family. So I don't know, I think maybe it explains a lot about Chinese history or something like that. But uh, uh, that's all I have. All I thought of. Any? Do you have something to add? Misconceptions yeah. about Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Thanks. Well, okay, this is also not prepared, but I thought I would say a few words about Polish because it's one of the languages I have on my uh, name tag, and it's one that most people probably haven't heard of. Um, Polish is a Celtic language. Uh, relate, most closely related to Welsh and Breton, and it used to be spoken in the southwest corner of Great Britain. Uh, and when I say used to, I mean as a community language. Uh, it died out about the end of the 18th century, I think. After that, it survived in a few people with some songs, some verses, some sayings, but it wasn't in regular use as a community language anymore uh, for about a hundred years, at which point beginning of the 20th century, people started to think, well, we are Cornish, we have a certain sense of nationality. Um, there used to be a Cornish language, didn't there? And they started looking at the old texts that had been preserved, and they um, revived the language, uh, and are now trying to get it spoken against. They published grammars, they published teaching books, and since 1907-ish, people have started using it again. There are now at least some second generation native speakers. Um, total number of speakers vary about 2,000 or something like that in total, but that represents various degrees of fluency. Um, to revive the language uh, from the old texts, obviously, one problem that they had was that uh, the corpus that they had didn't have every possible Cornish word, and it didn't have every possible form of every possible Cornish word, so there had to be a lot of interpolation going on, people finding for instance, a present tense of a verb and thinking, well, what could the infinitive have been? And they just, you know, make a, or what is the plural of this noun? Um, that they just make things up. Sometimes there are different groups that make things up a little bit differently, which can cause problems. Um, but I think everybody tries to represent theirs as 
uh, the Cornish language. They're all dialects of, of the modern revived Cornish language. Uh, and to fill gaps in the vocabulary, they often took words from Welsh and or Breton, um, because they all have the same ancestor, and they sort of worked backwards in time towards what would it have been in the original language, and then worked forwards what would it have been in Cornish if this same word had survived. Um, and now Cornish can be used to, to talk about all sorts of things. There are big dictionaries, and there are people using it for various purposes. It is, there is at least one um, nursery school where Cornish is used with the children as the only language. The children grow up in an immersion environment. Um, some attempts to get Cornish taught at schools with varying results, um, partly due to the availability of teachers, and partly due to the natural propensity of children to be enthusiastic about the language they are forced to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so it remains to be seen where that will go. Um, one important <coughs> issue for Cornish at this moment, I think, is normalization, meaning to treat the language as um, people treat their native language and use it for everything, for complaining about the weather, for talking about when the next bus will come, for a doctor's appointment. At the moment, I would say that probably most speakers of Cornish use it to speak about Cornish, <laughs> or maybe to speak about an upcoming event or something like that. But um, it's perhaps symptomatic. The BBC Cornwall has got a five-minute segment every week called um, And the Water, the News, and it's completely in Cornish. It's basically a summary of that week's news in Cornish. And people are sometimes asked, why don't you talk about this upcoming event or about um, the recent uh, um, acknowledgement of, Corn of the Cornish people as a minority uh, under, Euro under EU rules or whatever. And the newscaster said, well, because we don't want it to be about the news about Cornish, we want it to be the news in Cornish. So this is something that people are also trying to move towards to use it quite naturally with their friends, which is sometimes difficult if they move to live as far apart as they do. And it's mostly in Cornwall, but it's not the case that you can just walk down the street and use it in every shop. It's starting to grow, uh, and it's an interesting thing. There are distance learning courses available. So if a Celtic language is your thing and you don't want something boring like Welsh or Irish, give <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cornish a try. And there are a few people you can use to talk to. There is a weekly podcast, one hour, in which you can hear Cornish spoken. Most of the podcast is music, but there is a bit of news and a few interviews if you can find somebody who's willing to say something um, off the cuff rather than, wait, give me half an hour to write it down and then I'll read it, because not everybody is as fluent as they might like to be, but it's an interesting language. Thank you. Do you see the last two, three sentences in Polish? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm that fluent. Uh, um, I'm going to say it's a fine speech. Niwan Marek, hello. Leveral Ola, Hena, in Trinoic, Dretton Me, the Vos, Otiski, Hua, Mes, Mia Il, Leveral, Viu, We All, Vos, Kernoic, Ye, Moor, Murderlays, Har, Disco, Hey. Can you teach us hello and goodbye so we can all say something? <laughs> <laughs> At least to you. <laughs> well, um, hello is this da, it's good day. This da, and for goodbye, dear Guinness, which is God be with you. Yes. Yes. I only know Emmett. And Emmett, uh, yeah, the yeah, the one. One. Okay, so before dinner, we have place for one more talk. Two more, there's ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Before dinner, we have place for two more dogs. Otherwise, catch me okay. around. And okay, you. Uh, yeah, come. Yeah. 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 You, uh, the last one who wanted to make the last one? Yeah, okay. okay. My first instinct was like, it's often like a shout or like something for it. Language to to others, and I did my degree in Scottish Gaelic. It was all taught in English, and we had a great visitor to our university, the Irish president at the time, Mary MacLees, was invited. And she came and what she said was uh, she came, 
She's very familiar with Irish Gaelic, which I also speak. And she said she'd come to Scotland to the Gaelic speaking area and expected to find a distant cousin. And what she had actually found was a long lost sister in that uh, the links between the two languages, although they're very close to each other, you can compare them to maybe Dutch and German or Spanish and Italian, so they're not the same language, but with a bit of effort and using words which are common to both languages, we can understand each other. Um, I've been involved with uh, the same come up in Columbia Initiative, which is similar to Colum here, we call it in Scottish Gaelic, and similar to Colum here, we call it in Irish Gaelic. Uh, and that was set up under the Good Friday Agreement and the Peace Process in Northern Ireland. <coughs> what we had was um, 12 students who were all fluent Scottish Gaelic speakers, and then 12 from the north of Ireland, 12 from the south all speaking Irish, so I had 24 Irish speakers and only 12 Scottish Gaelic speakers who weren't allowed to speak English with each other. So that meant uh, that gave us Scottish Gaelic speakers a real good opportunity to, to learn some Irish and what we found was we just we came up with a pigeon language <laughs> and you know like our word for, well there's several words but the word we usually use for speaking is green but in Irish green means arguing or shouting. <laughs> so we came up with flowers which like cool out a joint speaking would be like a conference which well this this would be a cool out. Um so yeah it's finding the common words and so it is possible. And I think for the future because the situation for both languages is very similar. Uh, in that we have approximately 60,000 speakers officially, however, only about 10,000 use it as an everyday language, and that applies for both Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic. So the biggest resource that both communities have really is each other. You know, if we can try and develop, you know, joint television or radio, because then we're sharing resources. Uh, so I think I'll finish by just introducing you a little bit to the Scottish Gaelic language. It's a very interesting language. We've only got 18 letters in the alphabet. It's got far more individual sounds in English. Um, people who have overheard me speaking the language, which I had the pleasure of speaking it today to somebody for the first time in a conference, say, uh, thought it was a Semitic language. A lot of people think it's Arabic as well, a lot of sounds And we have no word for yes or no. And so if you ask a question, use the verb. So in Gav, if you for coffee, will you take a cup of coffee? You have to say Gai or Chagav. Will take or not will take. Also, our colours are not, in most languages that I've studied, the colours are based on the colours of the rainbow. Well, that's not the case in Gaelic. We base the colours on natural colours outside. So that's why we have three greens, uh, two different blues, two reds. Um, for example, I mean, the tree out there, that would, I would describe that, the colour would be Uanya, which is, what is generally translated as green, whereas grass would be Gorm, which is blue. Because Gorham is not, it's not an exact match for the English word blue. So <laughs> Orange means brown. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yes, the, yeah, so also, if anyone's interested in either Scottish Gaelic or Irish Gaelic, um, you know, you're welcome to come in. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any questions about the language? Anyone? Uh, yes, so as a bodyguard, uh, you might be one of the internet users who is looking up online dictionaries, uh, various different online dictionaries, oftentimes a day. And I have programmed, web I have programmed a web service uh, already running for some years 
to make that easier, and not only that, but also other things. So it's called uh, Searchilo, and who knows what this means? Search tool. I'm sorry? Search tool. Yeah, it's a search tool, like search engine. So I just picked that name because I was running for at the time. Searchilo.net. Um, and what it does, it makes uh, the sub tagline is search of shortcuts. So what you can do is when you get on the site, it recognizes your language from the, your browser settings. So if it's German, then it will say, okay, you're a German user. And then when you enter things like EN and say uh, tree, then it will just pick the English German dictionary for you and direct you to, uh, this, in this case, it's Leo dictionary and get you the translation of tree. Um, or like, so it's all, all the ISO language codes for us, like ZH is for uh, Chinese, uh, ES for Spanish, and so on. Um, like another command is a GTR for Google Translate, so you can enter something like GTR, and then, um, yeah, say it comes from Chinese, and then a URL behind this. So it will redirect you to the Google Translate, translating this URL from Chinese to your, uh, to your native language. Um, yeah, and it's open source, um, programming it, I will relaunch it soon. If you are um, good at programming, if you know PHP, if you uh, can do um, app programming for uh, Android and so on, I would be appreciate to have some help for this, to have it like, also running on Android phones or iPhones. Um, yeah, and so not only for language uh, or dictionaries, like all these search engines <laughs> work there, uh, you can see train connections, like all of this shortcut system, always a keyword and then the arguments behind it all. Um, yeah, that's it.